Well, good morning, everyone. I've got one question for us today to be thinking about. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to today? There's so much of things to hear about at the moment, isn't there? Stuff in the news, the daily COVID briefings in the media, things from schools, things from colleagues, things from family. So much information coming our way on social media too. Um, and without realising it, all these different things can just become the norm and they can begin to settle in and they can become the main thing to which we're listening to. There's a real difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is when it's a bit more passive. You're not really interested in what's being said. Listening is active. You're wanting to participate and you're wanting to give some consideration and thought to what is being said. As we go through this passage today, um, I want to be asking you that question, to have that in your mind. Who are you listening to? Who is the loudest voice you're listening to in your life right now? Last week, Jane helped us look at uh, Jesus when he predicted his death for the first time and his identity as the Messiah is the thing by which everyone is pointing towards this, this journey of Jesus towards Jerusalem, where he would fulfill his mission. This year, we've called this series, we're going through Luke's Gospel, Equipped on the Way. And we're calling it Equipped on the Way for two very deliberate reasons. One, because part of our vision for this year is we want to equip everyone to grow in confidence and share in their faith with others. But the reason why we're going through Luke's Gospel as we do that is because as Jesus walks and works with his disciples on his road towards the cross in Jerusalem, there's this sense of Jesus equipping his disciples. And so we're journeying with Jesus and his disciples and we're on the way with Jesus towards Easter. We're not far away from Easter. And this is a crucial moment, as we will see today, not long after Jesus proclaims his identity and says, I'm going to go to the cross and die. It doesn't quite set in those terms as we looked at last week. But that's, what, that's from where these verses today pick up. Every word that Luke writes in this gospel has meaning. No word has been used without specific purpose or double meaning, veiled meaning, surface level stuff. There's lots there in everything that Luke says and I think we see that in different ways this morning. And I'll unpack some of those different things as we go through. So let's read our passage uh, as we pick up in verse 28 of Luke chapter 9. About, after, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about to bring to fulfilment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves, and they did not tell this to anyone at the time what they had seen. One of the things I love about Jesus is he's both simultaneously so easy to understand and grasp at a real surface level meaning. But yet, at the same time, there's so much more deeper things with which we can discover about Jesus. He's both so easy and so complex. What an amazing God in human flesh we worship in Jesus. And so Jesus, he, he goes up a mountain with his disciples, Peter, John and James, and then there's amazing scene happens wouldn't you just love to be one of those disciples being there being in one of their shoes Jesus was praying and the appearance of his face changed 
and his clothes become as bright as lightning. Herein, I think, lies the first double meaning. I think it's perhaps reminiscent and an allusion to Exodus 33 and 34 and a little bit of Exodus chapter 24, where there Moses' face, when he's before God, changed and is, becomes bright and shines as the glory of God surrounds him. But yet the veiled meaning of this in what happens here with Jesus, with his face changing and his clothes changing, is that the destination on the journey to which he and his disciples were headed in Jerusalem, well, it wouldn't be the place by which his face would be changed in the same way in Jerusalem. No, Jesus' face wouldn't be transfigured in Jerusalem. It would be disfigured. Jesus' face wouldn't be shining as bright as it is here, but it would be stained in blood from the crown of thorns being worn on his head. Jesus' clothes, they wouldn't be flashing as bright as lightning. But in Jerusalem, they'd be exchanged by the soldiers mocking Jesus. Jesus wouldn't be in Jerusalem standing between the two greats of the Old Testament in Moses and, El and Elijah. No, in Jerusalem, Jesus would be hanging on a cross between two criminals. This mountaintop encounter is a magnificent one. Sure, I'm no doubt Peter, John and James it remained with them till they died. If you've ever been onto a mountaintop, you're one of them have taken a photo. And these, these photos behind me, these are um, from Queenstown in New Zealand. I took them myself to try and capture the moment of my gobsmacked face when I walked up for hours and hours to these bits of, not quite the top of the mountain, but not far off. I wanted to capture them. I wanted to remember what was going on. And I've no doubt Peter and John and James had this same sense, an encounter and an experience in this very moment. And yet they knew that they had to come down from that. I knew when I took those photos, I had to come down. And Jesus knew too, at the top of this mountain, where the glory and the presence of God was so present and tangible that he had to come down. And he had to come down to go into the valley. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll perhaps know that it's literally situated within a valley. And there's another great thing that we can encounter and discover here. From the mountain top to the valley low, we can be assured always that Jesus is with us. You might feel right now that you're on a mountaintop experience, encountering God. That's class. Praise God. Love it. You're going to have to come down at some point. Just, just I don't want to put a damp squid on it. You might also feel as though you're at the depths of the bottom of the valley right now. You feel hopeless. You feel there's, there's no way out whatsoever. From the mountain top to the valley low, God's presence, Jesus, is with us. And if we feel like we're in the valley low, and there's a sense of, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know where there's a way out, we can be assured today that there is. There is an exit, there is a way out, and it's in the exodus that Jesus provides. You see, in verse 31, in your translations, it says that they spoke about his departure. Moses and Elijah speaking to you about his departure. In your Bibles, it might have a little tiny footnote that says, in the Greek, exodus. Do you see the double meaning yet again here? Moses is present. It's by no coincidence that they're speaking about Jesus' exodus, Jesus' departure. Moses, of course, in the Old Testament in Exodus was the one that led God's people out of slavery and under the tyranny from the bondage of slavery in Egypt into the promised land. Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, that would be the place by which Jesus would lead all of humanity out of the greatest exodus of all time, from that of sin and death to one of life and forgiveness. Moses was great, but Jesus is greater. A 
I mean, wouldn't you just love to have been there? In earshot of Moses, this great Old Testament figure of law, and in Elijah, that great prophetic hope and person of the last days. Earshot, within earshot, of these three greats. Jesus, the King of glory. You see, the difference between Moses and Jesus is far, far greater. You see, Moses, he stretched out his arms when he stood at the edge of the sea, ready to depart the sea, to lead God's people away from the Egyptians. And yet Jesus was willing to hang on his cross with his arms outstretched wide to lead the greatest charge of Exodus of all of human history. You see, for the exodus of, of Moses in the Old Testament, for Jews, that shaped their lives daily. And much of the Old Testament, we see God's people giving thanks and praising God for what he'd done in sending the Deliverer to redeem them from Egypt. Here's a question. With Jesus' great exodus, the greatest exodus, is that shaping your life daily? Are you living a cross-shaped, cross-centred life? That transfigured face of Jesus in Luke 9 would become the disfigured face of Jesus on Good Friday. Where he showed the depths of his love for you and I. And all of this it accumulates in verse 35 where the voice on the cloud says this is my son whom I have chosen there's double meaning yet again here back in Deuteronomy at chapter 18 Moses is given a command to God's people and says there's going to be a prophet that God is going to send listen to him the crucial word in that command is listen to him. Then in Luke's gospel, right at the start, at Jesus' baptism, these phrase this we, we hear in Luke chapter 9, familiar, isn't it? We heard it several weeks ago, way back before Christmas. God says, this is my son, whom I have chosen, and my beloved son. You're my son, and I'm well pleased with you. You see, Jesus is that prophet to listen to and Jesus is God's son affirmed at Jesus' baptism the voice on the cloud says this is my son Jesus look at him listen to him so I ask again this morning who are you listening to is it Jesus Now, personally, I found this lockdown the hardest of all three of them. In recent weeks, I've found that I've had to really make the conscious decision to zone out everything that's going on around me because I found my anxiety levels increasing as this lockdown has continued to increase. And I've had to make the really conscious decision every single day to tune that stuff out and say, you know what, God, I'm going to choose to listen to you this day above everything else that's going on and I've had to give some more time to my, in silence I've had to give some more time in prayer and I've been listening to my audio bible more than I ever have done usually I just read it but actually listening to the bible being read to me with my headphones on you see in confusing times like this in lockdown and the next few weeks and months will no doubt continue to be confusing and troubling for lots of us in lots of different ways where anxiety might set in, depression might set in, fear might set in, doubt might set in. Is this ever going to end? In fact, some of these things might already exist. And for some of us, they might exist all simultaneously at this one moment in time. For whatever it is that's speaking loudest in your life at the moment, what is it you can do to try and block that stuff out? Because what we hear from this voice in the cloud saying is this is Jesus listen to him whose voice are you listening to 
What might it be that's perhaps stopping you or resisting you from listening to Jesus? Perhaps by way of a metaphor, this may or may not be helpful for some of you this morning. Um, I've got these headphones, I started listening to my audio Bible, and I've literally been listening to them more over the last few weeks with these headphones on. They're not the best at sound counselling. They do a good job. But for me, this, this very physical thing of actually saying, I'm going to put these on and I'm going to choose to listen to you, God, through the words of scripture in worship songs. I'm going to choose to listen to you and block out everything else. Who are you listening to? Because we can take the greatest confidence in the truth that Jesus has led the greatest charge in the exodus of all of human history because of the depths of his love for you. He's on his way to Jerusalem as we go through Luke's gospel. He's on his way to the cross because that's where he knew his mission was to be accomplished. So as we journey through Lent, we start Lent in just a few days' time. As we journey, continue to journey through Luke's gospel on this year of equip. As we continue through lockdown, whose voice are you listening to? Whose voice is loudest? I want to suggest one very quick practical thing we haven't got time to talk about today. Session seven of the prayer course that Pete Gregg has done. It's free to access online. Check it out. There's lots of really helpful practical ways in which we can begin to try and put into practice to help us listen to God better in our day-to-day lives. I'm going to finish in just a moment. But this week, I loved that reminder in 1 Samuel chapter 3, where Eli and Samuel are speaking and Samuel keeps getting confused that Eli's calling him, but it's not. And Eli says to him, Eli realises, Samuel, it's, it's God calling you. She says, Samuel, go to God and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the very next verse, in 1 Samuel 3, verse 10, Samuel says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to pause and we're going to listen. And we're going to say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Place